Okay, fun seekers, have we got a treat for you. We are going to go through a 1040 form for a typical homeowner. And it is an ordeal. <laughs> but hopefully what we will show you by the end is that it's really not as difficult as people make it out to be. But before we get started, I want you to make sure you have a copy of the tax exercise first. Either easily available on your screen so you can bounce back and forth, or print it out, preferably. I'm going to bounce back and forth in the presentation, and I hope the technology doesn't uh, disappear from me, run away from me. We'll find out. So I want you to to get out tax exercise first. Here it is. And it has a, it's the form 1040 with somebody's name on the front. And so who is that? A King Back. A King Back. <laughs> yeah, A King Back. Yeah, you know King. He's a, he's a good guy. He's Yeah, anyway, he put his social security number down. And he put his address. So here is the uh, identifying information. Make sure you put your social security number down, folks, because some people forget it. And the IRS gets very persnickety. And make sure they know how to get in touch with you. They will never call you, even though they ask for your phone number. I don't know why. And the California asks for not only your phone number, they ask for your email, but they don't contact you that way. They always send everything via U.S. mail. So make sure they have your current address. And what some people do is they will conveniently forget to put their Social Security number or they will conveniently forget to sign their return. Don't do that. Or they will write in the margins, IRS sucks. Taxes are unconstitutional. You guys are poopy. Don't do that either. Why? Because the IRS got tired of it. One guy sent his return on the back of a t-shirt. And so they petitioned the Congress to allow them to issue fines for what are called nuisance or frivolous returns. And I think it's up to either a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars per instance. If you forget to put your social security number or you forget to sign it, contact them immediately and they will tell you what to do to remedy the situation. Now, as we said in the previous presentation, we talked about the filing status. A King is single. But he is qualified as a head of household. He has a dependent that he cares for 50% plus one dollar of their care. And so he gets to uh, mark head of household for his filing status, which gives you a better deal than single, but not quite as good as if you were married. But still, it's a good deal. Better than single. So he marks down that he is exempt he marks himself down and puts number one here and then he puts his dependent or dependents in this case he only has one it's his son and it's wayne wayne de back wayne de back <laughs> and uh they want your social security number of your son they want the social security number of your dependents so you have to go get it and you have to put it down and it didn't used to be that way. It did not used to be that you had to write down the Social Security number of the dependents. And then one year the IRS changed the regulations and said you have to put down the Social Security number. And you know, the funniest thing happened, folks. Eight million dependents disappeared. Right. Uh, would people cheat on their taxes? Not in the United Snakes of Armenia. Uh, yeah, people cheat on their taxes here. They cheat on their taxes everywhere. It's, it's some, as we said, some countries. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a sport. <laughs> and because Wayne Deback is under seventeen, he is also going to uh, 
give a king a child care, child tax credit. I'm sorry, not the child, child care credit, but the child tax credit, which we'll take a look at later on, uh, on in the 1040 form. So he has two exemptions, and we will come back to those exemptions uh, later on, on page number two. For now, there's the identifying information. We are now going to move to the middle part of page number one, where we introduce, where we uh, write down, enumerate all the income. The vast majority of people will only have one, maybe two entries here. And the mo by far the biggest entry is wages. The W-2 form that you receive, or forms that you receive from your employer or employers. You write down the gross salary here. And it's on the box that tells you where to put it on the W-2 form. We'll take a look at a W-2 form later on. And then you may have taxable interest. You may have some tax-exempt interest. You may have dividends if you have stocks and tax. Yeah, And you know what, folks? Most people won't. Most people won't have alimony, taxable refunds, business income, capital gain or loss, IRA distributions. But that's where these would go. And that's when the tax uh, return can come pretty darn tricky. If you have a business, Schedule C, Line 12. If you have uh, rental properties, Line 17, Schedule E, farm income, and it get, can get pretty scary. But... We're just going to deal with the average individual who has a job and maybe has some taxable income. And we sum all of these up. In our case, it's only two. And we come up with the total income, sometimes the gross income. Okay? Then what we do on page one is we then reduce that gross income, that total income, by any what are called adjustments to income and you can read through these some of them are self-explanatory explanatory some are a little difficult to understand and uh, you have to dig deeper but in our case we're only going to take advantage of two the IRA deduction that a king makes to his own IRA traditional IRA and student loan interest he has a student loan and Many people get to take advantage of the adjustment to income that is student loan interest. But there are others, uh, moving expenses if you're moving for work, educator expenses, expenses if you're kindergarten through 12th grade teacher and you buy supplies for your classroom that the school does not provide, the government says, yeah, well, we'll let you uh, deduct that. Uh, from your taxes using an adjustment to income. Health savings accounts, we'll discuss those in uh, Chapter 9 when we get to health care. Uh, so some of these are fairly straightforward. Others are a little bit more tricky. But it's not difficult to follow these through and at least understand kind of where they are coming from, right? I think so. So that's page number one. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to the presentation and show you on slide number 12 that we were trying to uh, describe that on this slide. The top half of page number one are the income entries, wages, interest, investment returns, business profit, real estate profit, pension fund income, etc., 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 and they are totaled. And then we reduce that income by what are called adjustments to income, student expenses, retirement contributions. And we come up with what is called the adjusted gross income. The total income minus the, the adjustments to income are, is, I'm sorry, is the gr adjusted gross income, the AGI. It goes on the bottom line of the front page and then we'll see it then is moved to the top line of the back page. The adjusted gross income is a very important number. Many tax items are tied to the AGI such as the ability to contribute to retirement accounts or utilize certain deductions and personal exemptions and we'll see 
at least one example of this uh, later on. The next slide, excuse me, next slide is a different view, but it's this it's the same thing. We're trying to get it across to you that we include all the earned income, business income, uh, alimony received, uh, investment income, real estate, rental property, and the like, and sum that, total that, on line 22. We then list any adjustments to income, IRA contributions, student loan interest, alimony paid, if we have expenses and we're a kindergarten through 12th grade teacher, and we total those adjustments to income, and then we take the total income, subtract the adjustments to income, and that gives us the adjusted gross income. Does that make sense, folks? Let's go over it just one more time to make sure. And I want you to study this. I want you to study this because, as we said, it's really not that hard. You just got to do it enough times so that you go, okay. So here are all the locations for income. But in reality, most people are only going to use one, maybe two. We sum those, we total those, and put that on line 22. And then we enter all the adjustments to income. And again, most people have one, maybe two. Many people have zero. We total that on line 36 and then compute the adjusted gross income. Piece of cake? All right, well, here's where it's going to start to get a little tricky. Slide number 14, deductions. <laughs> it turns out that there is a tremendous confusion when, when we, as soon as we turn to the top of page number two, because there is a standard deduction that people are allowed to take advantage of, and then there are itemized deductions that our people, our people are allowed to take advantage of. But the problem is you cannot claim both. You can either claim the standard deduction or you can claim the itemized deductions, but you cannot claim both. And this drives people cuckoo. It makes them very confused. We will say this over and over again as we go through the, this presentation and even into the next presentation. But then there are personal exemptions. Now, this is not an either-or situation. Everybody gets to take advantage of the personal exemptions unless your adjusted gross income goes over a certain amount and then they become phased out. So you see how tricky things can get? Yeah, most of us working grunts will be able to take care of our, take advantage of the personal exemptions, but some people will not once they reach a certain amount. So now let's run back to the exercise and see that we're going to move from page number one. Remember that number there, 50,000, the adjusted gross income for A King back. And we're going to come wee onto page number two. And you see, we, we um, reiterate, we enter the adjusted gross income once again on line 38. Now, here's where it starts to get a little tricky, line 40. Oh, by the way, if you're over uh, 65 or blind, you get to uh, check these little boxes here, and that's going to help you pay fewer taxes. So once you're over 65 and once if you are blind... You get to take advantage of these. And I saw a cute, this was many years ago, a cute little cartoon of a guy uh, at the IRS office, and he's kind of just kind of, he has a very dumb look on his face, kind of smiling, half grimacing, and the, and the IRS agent is saying, well, Mr. Watson, the reason we called you in here is because all three of your wives are over 65 and blind. It's a joke. I apologize. Not a very good one, but I thought it was cute. Anyway, so here... Let's take a look at the left-hand side of this uh, form here. You see where it says standard deduction? It's telling you that you can take this standard deduction depending on your filing status. If you're single or married filing separately, separately it's $6,300. For 2015, it goes up every year. 
with inflation for uh, married filing jointly or the qualifying widow or widower it's 12,600 twice that amount and if you're head of household it's 9,250 so you see the head as we said the head of household is in between the single and married filing jointly so if he's head of household he would take 9,250 he would write that number down there if he were taking the standard deduction aha is a king taking the standard deduction no he is itemizing his deductions he is putting a number that is far greater than the 9,250 he is saying I have deductions that surpass that uh, go above that are more than the standard deduction now do you get to just write a number in there and uh, hope the IRS takes it no <laughs> you are required to itemize which is a fancy word of saying list them and where do we list them we're going to scramble on down to schedule a schedule a is where we enumerate where we list where we write our itemized deductions Schedule A is the homeowner's friend because almost always the reason you use Schedule A is because you own a home. There are some situations where people who are not homeowners can use Schedule A, but they are the exception, not the norm. And it, we will see why as we go through this. The first section are medical and dental expenses. Now, is it realistic to believe that a king with a son Wayne did not have any medical expenses that were not reimbursed by health care or by somebody else no he probably had some expenses co-pays and the like or some drugs he had to pay for but why did he not put them down well it turns out that you have to have at least 10% of your adjusted gross income before you can start uh, deducting medical expenses. So there's that adjusted gross income we talked about. Remember the $50,000? You see where it says multiply line 2, which is the, the adjusted gross income that you, you, you grab that from your, from your form. You put the medical and dental expenses here. You grab the AGI, the adjusted gross income. Why don't they just say AGI? I don't know. They, they, they want to keep you in the dark, I think. And then they say multiply that by 10%. Now, if you're over 65, it's only 7.5%, but that changes, I think, in 2017. I'm not sure. But anyway, 10%. Uh, well, that's $5,000. So you have to have at least five, or I'm sorry, a king. A king has to have at least $5,000 worth of medical expenses before he can begin to deduct the medical expenses. So if he had 3000 or 2000 or 1000, don't even bother putting it there. But if he had 6 or 7 or 8000, then he could start deducting his medical expenses. So you would subtract the $5000 from whatever it was, say $6000 and you'd be able to deduct that. So if he had $6,000 of medical expenses, subtract the 2% of his 10%, I'm sorry, 10% of his of his adjusted gross income and that would be $5,000 and so he'd have $1,000 that he could deduct. Did I confuse you? If I did, my apologies, go back and listen to it again, but realize that you don't want to take advantage of the medical deductions because that means somebody's sick and they don't have very good health insurance. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, state taxes and other taxes that you paid. In this case, we can deduct our income taxes or our sales taxes, but you can't do both. And in tax states such as California, New York, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, Illinois, states that have high income taxes, it almost always makes sense to take the income tax deduction. In other states where they either have very low income taxes or they have no income taxes, 
you would take the general sales tax. And so A King paid $1,000 in state income taxes. So we write that down. And he also owns a condominium and pays $2,900 in real estate taxes. And every year you get a little form that tells you how much you paid in real estate taxes. Often you pay it when you pay your mortgage. It's called an escrow account. And so he writes that down. Also, he has a fairly new car. And when you register your car, there's one line called the vehicle license fee. That is a personal property tax. So you get to write that. You get to use that as, a, as an itemized deduction. What often people do is they take the entire amount. And I don't know how many times the, the IRS actually goes after people for that because I'm sure it's, just, it's more work for them than they, they think. But you're only supposed to take the one line, the vehicle license fee. So if you add up those taxes, you'll find that he has paid $4,100 in, in taxes other than the, you know, the income tax to the federal government. Is that more than the 9250 we saw on the 1040 form? No. So if he had no other deductions, he wouldn't bother itemizing. He would take the standard deduction. What's going to push him over the edge? You got it. Right. The home mortgage interest deduction. And that's why we call Schedule A the taxpayer's friend. Because this line here, line number 10, is the one that pushes people over that standard deduction often. And in Southern California's case, pushes them way above that. <laughs> in A. Kingback's uh, uh, case, he paid $14,400 in uh, home interest deductions, home interest. So he gets to write that down, and that's going to push him over that standard deduction, isn't it? So he writes down the 14400 here. And there's a few other things that you can write if he had mortgage insurance premiums, if he had uh, points, and what are points? They're things at the end of a stick that people hit you in the eye. No, no, not in this case. They are the uh, privilege, that's the privilege you pay, the fee you pay for the privilege of getting a loan. What a deal, huh? Wait till we get to Chapter 7. Um, and so he didn't pay them. He's, he, he paid that you know, a long time ago. He still he owns his condominium. So that's the only item in the interest that he paid, 14400 Here is where we have uh, gifts to charity, where an individual can give money to a, their church or Father Joe's or, or uh, KPBS, our public television station or Southwestern Community uh, College Foundation. We're a nonprofit. You can not the college itself, the foundation that's tied to the college is a nonprofit. And so you have to keep very good records and they, they don't accept a uh, canceled check. The, the charity is going to send you a little letter saying how much you have given to them. And you add that up with any um, other types of gifts where um, uh, it might not be cash. It might be a, a car or whatever that you donate. And then there is a limit to how much you can do every year. So you might be able to carry over charitable contributions from a previous year. But in most people's case, they won't be doing that. They're giving He's giving 1% you know, of his salary, $500 to his church or whatever. And he puts that down. All right. So we're slogging through the Schedule A. Anything else? Well, casualty and theft, if you had those pro, uh, unfortunate items, you might be, you may not, but you might be able to deduct those. And then the certain miscellaneous deductions, including job expenses. These are similar to the uh, medical expenses. You add them all up, but you can only deduct what is over 2% of the adjusted gross income. So again, you add up all these puppies right there, the uh, tax preparation fees, union dues, travel for job, uh, investment and safety deposit uh, expenses, and you put them, the total of those on line 24, and then we did the same thing that we did up in medical. 
we go and grab the adjusted gross income, but instead of multiplying it by 10%, we multiply it by 2%. And remember, A King made $50,000, so 50,000 times 2% is $1,000. So the first $1,000, he would, he would not be able to deduct, so he didn't even bother because he didn't have over $1,000. But anything over 1000 you would put right here. All right? And then there are a few uh, other miscellaneous deductions that you may or may not be able to take. He didn't have any of those. So he adds up all the numbers from above and gets 19000 Now, there may be, <laughs> you may be limited to how much you can actually deduct. So again, here comes the adjusted gross income. If, see, they don't use the term, but they should because I think most people know it. But if your adjusted gross income is over $154,950 in 2015, then you may have your deduction limited. So if it's under, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I know most people don't even bother clicking this box, but you're supposed to just click that box and no problem. You don't have to, um, um, you don't have to worry about not being able to use your itemized deductions. But if you are over that, you have to do another worksheet to see whether or not any of it is disallowed. But A King is nowhere near that. He, his adjusted gross income is 50000 and most people won't be anywhere near that, so they don't have to worry. So we take that 19000 and we go back up to line 40, and there it is. Now, do you have to send in all the receipts? No, 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 no. You only have to itemize on Schedule A. Do you need to keep the receipt? Yes, you do. Because if the IRS sends you a friendly official looking letter that says you said that you gave $500 to Father Joe's Village, you need to send, if send us the receipt, you need to send them the receipt. Mm hmm. Okay. So make sure it's a legitimate expense. Continue. So let's see what we got here. Let's go back to our presentation and see where we are at. There it is. Line, slide 14 is again trying to show you what we just went through on the, on the, uh, the form 1040 for A King. We take the standard deduction or we take the itemized deductions, but not both. And then we get to take, we haven't got to the personal exemptions yet. We'll take a look at those in just a minute. Okay. So let's go back to the, to the, uh, tax exercise. So here is the, uh, the, the, uh, the adjusted gross income minus the uh, these itemized deductions and they don't have a name for it i just call it a subtotal you just take 50,000 minus 19,000 and that's 31,000 now this line right here is the personal exemptions and again you see there it is they're asking you is the adjusted gross income less than 154,950 because it is if it is, you don't have to worry. You get to take advantage of the personal exemptions. If it's not, you may have those limited. But most people are not going to be over 154, so don't worry about it. In his case, he's way under that. He's 50,000. So he multiplies $4,000, which is the personal exemption for the year tax year 2015 times the number of people in his family, which, which in this case is two. So that's 8,000. 4,000 times two people, 8,000. And finally, <laughs> finally now, we have gotten to line 43, taxable income. So again, let's go back to the presentation and see where it describes the personal exemptions. As we said, you can claim the standard deduction, or you can claim the itemized deductions, but you can't claim both. And then you get to take advantage of the personal exemptions unless your adjusted gross income is too high. So on slide 15, we're showing the exact same thing again. We're trying to show you how we take the adjusted gross income minus the standard deductions minus the personal exemptions or we take the adjusted gross income minus the itemized deductions minus the personal exemptions. 
All right. So uh, you might want to stop the presentation and you know and, and noodle on it for a while. Think about it for a bit because it is confusing. It does confuse people. But once you've done it, you've made the calculations, you've done it a few times, it's really not that hard. It's really not, it's just, it's very tedious. Very, I like the word tedious. That's what people often say. Yeah, it's very tedious. And we finally got into line 43, which is taxable income, which is then used to compute tax due. So let's take a look, go back to the, to the, uh, uh, document and take a look at the taxable income. The taxable income is $23,000. We use that to compute the tax due, line 44. Well, how? This is another one of those bugaboos that scares people, but is really not that hard once they do it a couple of times. And that's the tax tables. When you Know what your taxable income is, and we know our taxable income was 23000 for a king back. Then we start sliding through the tax tables, and they start with 1000 3000 11000 12000 19 20 20 what 20 Ah, here we are, 23000 Right? Now, what do you do now? Well, let's go back up. And take a close look at this, and I hope, you know, if, you, if you're looking at this on a, on a mobile device, you probably can't read it, folks. But that's why I, you know, have this on the website. You can download it to your PC or Macintosh, or if you download it to your mobile device, it's still going to be a little hard to read. But here it says the tax filing status. Single, married filing jointly, or that qualifying widow or widower. Marrying, filing separately, and head of household. So this is the one we want. This is the column we want here for A King, head of household. And we want to go down to 23,000. And we see 23,000 here. Right, I'm sorry, right there. I can't get it. 23,000 right there. And we see 23,000 right there. Now, which one are we supposed to use? Well, if you use this one, the IRS... They'll probably just leave you. If you lose it, use this one. They'll probably just, who knows what they'll do. They'll say, you stole $6 from us or $4 or whatever it is. But uh, no, you're supposed to use the next one. You see it says, at least, but less than. So if you had $22,999.99, you would use this call row. But because we have hit $23,000, we've got to use this row. And I apologize. You know what? I, I'm afraid to make it bigger because I, I might mess things up. But it's this call, this row right here, this first row right here, and it's it's highlighting two rows. My apologies. But we come across to the married. I mean, sorry, head of household, and I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's two two thousand seven hundred and ninety six dollars. All right. So that's how you do it. And people look at all these numbers and they go, ah, ah, I can't figure it out, I can't figure it out. And then after they've tried it a couple of times, they go, oh, yeah, this is not that hard. I can figure this out. So we find the adjusted gross, I'm, not the, I'm sorry, the taxable income, and we go across to the table that pertains to our filing status, and that's the number we use, 2,796. So let's go back to the presentation. I'm sorry, back to the um, exercise and see that that's what I wrote in. $2,796. Make sense? Oops, that's not what I want to do. just wanted to highlight that. There it is. Okay. So now let's take a, go back to the presentation and see what we can read about to compute the tax due. The taxable income is used to compute the tax due. And for most people, they'll use the tax tables up to $100,000. Once you go above $100,000, then there's a different way. You use the schedules at the, at the, at the very bottom of the tax uh, tables. And But most people don't have over $100,000 of taxable due. So, I mean, taxable income, so you don't have to worry about it. Now, we're going to come back to this idea of marginal tax rate. The, the rate used to calculate the tax due on the next dollar of taxable income. Because this is a little tricky, folks. And and this, 
you know, again, is another one of the reasons that people scream and holler and they say the tax code is too complicated. And it is. But the marginal rate is really not the more, most complicated part of it. Once you understand it, it's actually fairly straightforward. There are six brackets. 10%, 15, 25, 28, 33, 35. And then the last one was reintroduced in 2013, the seventh one, 39.6 for people making over 400 some thousand. This is what's important, the marginal tax rate. Understanding our marginal tax rate is very important to us as financial planners of our financial situation. And a lot of people really don't understand it, but you're going to because we're going to hammer it away at you. The average tax rate is really not that important for planning purposes, but it's it's good to be aware of, if only to be able to debate some of the uh, ideas for how to fix the tax code. Uh, you'll hear people say about the flat tax, and we'll discuss that in, in detail in just a few moments. So, so, so how does this work? How does this work? What the tax tables do, folks, is they implement this for us. So if we go to the next slide, slide 17, what you're going to see are the marginal tax rates. This is how the tax table was created. Because here are the tax rates for single individuals, and here are the tax rates for, for married and, and um, filing jointly and qualifying widowers. We're not showing the head of household, but they're somewhere in between. The first $9,225 of taxable income, remember this is after we have reduced your gross income by the standard deduction or the itemized deductions and the personal exemption, is 10%. But then once you reach $9,225, you now are in the 15% tax bracket. The dollars between 9225 and 37450 are taxed at 15%. And then once you go above 37450, you are now being taxed at 25%. So you see a person, a single person making a decent income, it is very easy for them to reach the 25% tax bracket. And then 90,000, 28 189,033, 411,035, and then once you're over 413,000, now you're looking at almost 40%. And as we said, that 39.6 was reintroduced in 2013 after years of fighting between the two parties. You see, in 2001, they, they, they overhauled the tax system, but they made the rates temporary. And then every couple of years, they would redo them. At the end of 2012, there was a huge... Uh, clash, uh, if they call it the fiscal cliff fight, the, the Republicans wanted to uh, push the country over the fiscal cliff, and uh, they, they finally got together and worked something out, and they made the rates permanent until the next clash, <laughs> and what we're going to see is that they are adjusted for inflation. Now notice that the married couple, ha it's twice that amount. The first 18450 are at the 10%. And then up to 74,900 are 15%. So a married couple reaches 74,900, now they're in the 25% tax bracket. So so that's a pretty decent salary folks. Remember this is taxable income after your deductions, after your exemptions. And so a married couple is making a pretty good salary if they've made it into the 25% tax bracket. 150, 28, 230,000, 33, 411,000, 35, and then they have to be making 464,000 before they enter the 39.6. Now, what's going to happen? I want you to watch this number right over here, that 9,225, because we're going to go to the next slide, and 9,075. What happened? Well, these are the 2014 marginal tax rates. You see, the rates don't change. It's still 10%, 15, 25, 28, 33%. What happens is the brackets are adjusted upward every year according to inflation. And this makes sense. Think about it, folks. If inflation continues as it 
normally does, and you're getting paid more, if they don't adjust the brackets, then you're getting an automatic tax increase as inflation goes up. So the Congress, thank you very much, Congress, adjusts the rates upward. I'm not, not the rates, the brackets. The bracket, the rates stay the same. And so each year the brackets go up to take it into account inflation. The, the 2013 brackets were lower than the 2014, the 2012 were lower than the 2013, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first 9,075, do you want to go back one? Watch, well, I'm going to go back to the 2015, 9,075 for the single, 9,225 for the, for the um, single person in 2015. And if we now look at the married, 18,150 in 2014, 2015, 18,450. So they went up by $300. Are you following what's going on? And so we have a name for this, folks. We have a name for this type of tax system. It is called a progressive tax system. As you make more money, you are expected to pay more money. Are you with me? Yeah, now, there are people who don't like this. They, they, they think it's not correct. They think everybody should be traded equally. And they are often people who um, fight for what's called a flat tax. But I'm, I'm not going to take a position either side. I'm going to give you the, the uh, progressive uh, folks argument. They say, look, once you have made forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, You've you've paid for the shoes and the milk and the rent. You know you you've paid for the essentials, so now you are able to pay more. You are able to uh, contribute more to the society, and that's the argument for the progressive tax code. And as we said, some people are you know not too happy with that. They uh, don't like the progressive tax code. So that's a political discussion and an economic discussion that we are going to have over the next several years. The discussion actually will never end. So how does this allow us to compute those tax uh, amounts that are in the tax table? See, the tax table does these calculations for us. Look on slide number 19. This is not a king. This is somebody completely different. This is a single person with $38,450 worth of taxable income. All right? So um, that means they've taken away the adjustments, taken away the standard deduction or the itemized deductions, but not both, and they've taken away the personal exemptions. Well, it's a single person, so one exemption. Remember, the first $9,225 is at the 10% rate. So that's $9,225 times 10% or $920.50. But now, as soon as they reach 9225 every dollar above 9225 is now taxed, up until 37450 is now taxed at 15%. So the calculation is take the 37450 minus the 9225 and multiply that times 15%. Don't do the whole 34500 because that would be retaxing the first 9225 We don't want to do that. So that amount times 15%, 37,450 minus 9,225 times the 15% is $4,233.75. And then because this person went over the 37,450, we have to take whatever amount is over that. Now I used a number that makes it very easy, 38,450 minus 37,450, that's $1,000. So that just makes the calculation very easy. And we multiply that times the next tax rate of 25%. That turns out, it turns out to be $250. We add those three numbers, and that's the four, $5,406.25. And that's how those tax tables were calculated. See, the IRS just does it for you using computers, and they just make it easy for you to just look it up. But you could do this. You could do this. It'll be a little different because the tax tables use $50 increments but it's a few dollars off, all right? And as we say here, the first $9,225 is taxed at the first marginal rate of 10%. B, 
between 9225 and 37450 you are taxed at the second rate and any amount over that in this case is only $1000 more than that is taxed at the third marginal rate now if this gentleman or person this woman had gone over 90750 they would be bumped into the next tax bracket and so forth and so on and so it leaves us to uh, say that the next dollar you make is always taxed at your current marginal rate so as we're planning our our yearly uh, budget and the like and our yearly income we need to know what is the next dollar we make going to be taxed at because that's how we make decisions on the margin on regarding whether or not we do really want to earn that money or do we want to take advantage of this this tax uh, 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 deduction or this tax um, this investment that may reduce our taxes we might be in a lower tax bracket and then it you know it's not really that good a uh, investment a good an investment for us because it doesn't return as much as some another investment that is taxable but we're in such a low tax bracket that it really doesn't make any difference for us it, we'll get more money after tax if we just pay the taxes you see so it gets a little subtle and a little complicated but it's important for us to know our marginal tax rate the average tax rate is not that important when it comes to our our planning but it is important to understand because if we go back and look at that single taxpayer from the previous slide that person had three three thirty eight thousand four hundred fifty dollars of taxable income and five thousand four hundred six dollars and twenty five cents of tax due so if we take those taxes divided by the taxable income it turns out that this person who's making a pretty good salary I think I don't know about you but I think it's not bad is paying about 14 percent in taxes now you will hear the flat tax advocates say that everybody should pay uh, the flat tax everybody should pay the same amount and it should be 17 percent well really it's probably like 19 or 20 percent or maybe a little bit more and so who would win and who would lose with the flat tax well unless we do something to the flat tax people at the lower end would wind up uh, paying a lot more than they are now but then the flat tax advocates come out and say well look 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 we'll give everybody a standard deduction of twenty thousand dollars if they're single or thirty thousand dollars if they're married or fifteen thousand if they're single or whatever 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 will give them a standard deduction with no itemized deductions because that's what makes everybody crazy doing all these crazy things with home ownership and bidding up the prices of houses just so they can have tax uh, tax shelter and all these charities and all these other deductions that drive people crazy and so that's how we'll make the tax code simpler and we'll make it fairer because the people at the bottom will still not be asked to pay a whole lot more and then of course all the charities and the real estate agents and they all jump up and down and say you're destroying the bedrock of our society and and so you see how difficult it is for us to actually change the tax code because there are all these embedded uh, uh institutions that are dependent on the current tax code there's a whole other group of people who say don't tax income no 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 get rid of the income tax tax consumption they call it the fair tax yeah don't tax people for making money you want people to make as most much money as you can you want people to go out there and not worry about the marginal tax rate you want them to go out and generate as much income when do you get them when they buy when they consume it's sometimes called a, a value added tax and and uh, I was a big fan of this for many years, a long time ago. You know, I've since given up on on any. I mean, no, 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 you, you never give up. But still, there are problems with this. You know, it's not perfect. Um, and the one thing that really scared me is the Congress saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll add a value added tax. We won't get rid of the income tax. No, no, don't do that. That's not what we wanted. Because they'll say, well, you know, some other countries have VAT and they have high income taxes. You see how difficult it is. It ain't easy." The marriage penalty. What? 
Okay, stick, stick with me now. Now, again, if you're on a mobile device, you probably can't read this, and I apologize, but, but let me read uh, for you. If the marginal rates are higher for single taxpayers, how come we sometimes hear people complain about the so-called marriage penalty? Well, because the second wage earner in the family pays their taxes at the highest marginal rate for the, the two of them, they don't get to take advantage of the lower tax brackets. You see, see, here's what happens in a family. The, the, one of the spouses is working, the other one's staying home, and then they say, you know, let's go back, I'll go back to work, and he'll bring in some more money, and, and, uh, you, you know, think the kids are, are in school now. And what they find is they wind up paying a lot in taxes because that person's income starts at the highest tax bracket, at the marginal tax rate. And so there are often more expenses involved with the person going to work, maybe more child care, maybe more eating out more often, more transportation and like. So they, they scratch their heads and they say, you know, we're, we're working twice as hard and we're not making a whole lot more money. If there's only one wage earner, married couples get rewarded, not punished, but they need more money because they are two people. They're not just one single person. Now, in 2003, Congress removed the marriage penalty for the first two brackets, only for the first two brackets, and they extended it several times, making it permanent again, permanent again during that fiscal cliff debate of 2012, until the next time. So that's why you see the two first brackets, the number from the single to the married is twice the amount. So 9,225 times 2 is 18,450. Single, 37,450 times 2, 74,900. But once you leave that bracket, and now you're in the 25% bracket, it's no longer twice as much. And then the 28%, look, it's nowhere near twice as much. And then here, they're exactly the same. And here, they're just a little bit more. So, so yeah, when you're in the upper... You know, when you're making a decent salary, folks, don't uh, don't complain too much. But when you're making a very decent salary, you're hit by the marriage penalty. All right, the dreaded AMT, the alternative minimum tax. <laughs> this was originally meant to make sure everyone who could afford to pay some taxes would pay some taxes, and it was designed to target the very wealthy. But this was the late 1960s. And the AMT was and is still not indexed to inflation. $100,000 was a very unusual and substantial income in the 1960s when a house cost $15,000 and a car cost $2,000. But no, not anymore. $100,000 is a good salary. Don't get me wrong. But it's nowhere near what it was in the late 1960s. The alternative minimum tax will continue to affect more and more the middle class as wages climb especially two-income families in higher tax states. And every year there's always talk about the Congress eliminating it, but it would add one and a half, two trillion dollars to the budget deficit, so I don't know. I don't think it's going to get changed. We'll see. So let's go back now and come back to our, our, our document here and show where we're at to recap. We've done our stand uh, itemized deductions personal exemptions got our taxable income computed the tax due and on line 45 is where we would introduce the alternative minimum tax but a king is nowhere near the alternative minimum tax so he doesn't have to worry about it and then this is a uh, uh, advanced premium tax repayment you don't have to worry about that so uh, that's something that's very uh, strange so we don't have to worry about that uh, and then here we are. The IRS wants you to add these three num three call three cells, these three entries, and put the 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 amount there. If you don't do it, they're not going to yell at you. But they like to see that number here in line 44 brought down to line 47. Now we're ready for credits. So let's go back to our presentation and take a look at credits. Are you still with us? I know. I know. I know. This is. This is a lot, folks. It's a lot. But uh, you can stop and go back and replay it again. Tax credits are very cool, folks. They are amounts subtracted directly from the amount of taxes that are due. Foreign tax credits. Education credits. Tax 
child care credits, child tax credits, retirement savings credits, energy credits, earned well, the earned income credit is actually lower. And so if we go back to our, our uh, document, you'll find that many people won't have anything here, especially if they're single and don't have any kids. But if they have a child under the age of 17, they get a thousand bucks per child. Not bad, huh? Child costs more than a thousand dollars every year, so it's not worth it. And don't have children just for the tax credit. But uh, there you go, a thousand bucks. And A. King took some classes at Southwestern Community College, and so he was able to take a hundred dollars off uh, his uh, taxes using tax credits because tax credits are very cool. Once we sum up our tax credits on line fifty-five, we see that A. King was able to directly reduce his income tax, his tax due, dollar for dollar by the tax credits. 1696 He said 2796 minus the total credits of 1100 gives us 1696 Very cool. See, let's go to the next slide. Tax credit versus a tax deduction. Look at the bottom. A tax credit is worth more than a tax deduction? Yes. Why is that? Because a tax credit reduces your tax dollar for dollar off of your taxes. Where a tax deduction only reduces your tax by marginal tax rate, by the marginal tax rate. So a $100 tax credit is $100 off your taxes. A $100 tax credit depends on your marginal tax bracket. And if we're in the 25% tax bracket for the feds, 7% for the state of California, that's a $32 tax uh, reduction. So you see, what would you rather have? A tax credit or a tax deduction? Tax credit. And oh, <clears throat> by the way, there's never a reduction in Social Security taxes. So, we are now on line 56 here. What is this? More taxes? Are you serious? Yes. Here is where you have to put any self-employment tax if you have your own business or um, a household employment taxes or uh, uh, health care taxes, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act, often called Obamacare, Romneycare. Uh, if you have to, uh, if you did not pay your, uh, if you did not get insurance, you, you'll have to pay a penalty. So these are even more taxes that tend to drive people insane and most people are not going to be um, uh, affected by that. This one is really interesting. Uh, this, the household employment taxes, there's a, a long story that goes along with this that goes back to 1993. And I have a couple minutes, so please bear with me. Uh, then uh, President, uh, newly inaugurated President Clinton, nominated the first woman to be the nation's top cop, the Attorney General. Her name is Zoe Baird, and she was eminently qualified. She caught the bad guys. She looked like she was going to sail through Congress. Well, it turns out that Zoe Baird had a nanny, and she didn't pay the nanny's Social Security tax. She didn't even know she was supposed to. You see? Oh, my goodness. She, she's a lawyer. You know, she's a, she's a prosecuting attorney. She's an attorney general, and she doesn't understand the tax code. So... There goes Zoe Baird's nomination. So then uh, uh, President Clinton is determined to have a woman as the nation's top cop. So he uh, nominates Janet Reno. Again, eminently qualified, catch the bad guys. But Janet Reno is single and she's got that haircut, you know, lesbian haircut number four. And so there's a rumor started that she's you know, <clears throat> not of the uh, uh, heterosexual persuasion. And she was horrified. She said, no, I, I'm just an old maid. No one's ever asked me to marry. And so I'm single. And you, you cannot make this up, folks. Fact is always stranger than fiction. She started getting a wedding, you know, marriage proposals from men all over the country who had never met her. She had never met them. It's a, it's a wild world we live in, folks. Uh, there. Anyway, anyway, so are you going to have anything here? Very unlikely, very unlikely. So what the IRS wants you to do is take the number here, line 56, 
and move it down to 63. Yeah, I know, I know. It, you're exhausted and it's tedious and it is exhausting, but go through it again and I think you'll, um, you'll figure it out. There it is, the W-2 form, the little snitch that the, our, your employer sends to you and sends to the IRS so they know how much you made, they know how much was withheld, they know how much Social Security and Medicare and all the other good things that you put into the system. And the we oh, notice we're on slide 27. It says, hey, you only got a few slides left. Relax. The IRS has consistently said, and the courts have consistently agreed with them, that you need to pay as you go. You can't just wait until April of the next year and pay all your taxes at once. You're supposed to pay either through your employer or if you are self-employed or just earning income from your investments, you have to pay quarterly. And if you don't, you can have an under-withholding penalty. That's We'll take a look at where it is. It's near the bottom of the page of two. If you are hit with that under withholding penalty, then you should send a letter to the IRS saying, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I won't do it again. And I have helped people do this. I've never done this for myself, but I've helped people do this. And the IRS has invariably said, okay, we'll waive it. Not, you know, not not like an ocean wave, but wave meaning we will forego it. We will uh, uh, take it away this time, but don't do it again. Well, I have a good, actually, he's a family member, and he did it twice. I said, you know, the first time, I said, you got to go down and have more money taken out of your paycheck. He never got around to doing it, and the next year he got hit with the underreporting penalty, and we wrote another letter saying, now I'm really sorry. <laughs> I won't do it again, and the IRS approved it. And he went ahead and did have his, you know, he did have more money taken out of his, out of his paycheck. And what you find is that he's the exception. Most people get a t big tax refund, and they like that. That's forced savings. But I like the tax refund. Well, you're giving the feds a free loan, which with interest rates now near zero is not a big deal. But if you're using your tax refund to pay off your credit cards, folks, that's really a bad planning idea. It is much better to have fewer dollars taken out of your paycheck and pay off that credit card a whole lot faster. But, you know, it's your money. It's up to you. My advice, as humble as it may be, is to do your best to estimate your tax bill. Now, what does 90%, 100% mean? Hmm, those are interesting numbers. They may be useful for somebody doing an assignment uh, in Chapter 3, but they may not be. It's up to you. But but you try to have them owe you 100 bucks, or have you owe them $100. That's my uh, advice. That's what I do. It doesn't mean you should do it. But as I said, people like that big tax refund. It's not the best. Not, not ideal, but it's your money. It's up to you. How do you avoid common errors? Well, check your arithmetic twice. Attach the necessary documentation. Put your Social Security number, the tax year, tax form on the check. Make the check payable to the United States Treasury, not the Internal Revenue Service. Keep a photocopy. Put proper postage on your mailing envelope. Finally, check everything again. And if you need more time, file an extension. But we don't because we're done. We took the $1,696 that we owed and then we entered all the different places where we put payments into the system. Well, again, for most individuals, that will be right here. The income tax that was withheld from their paychecks. But they might have done some estimated tax payments. They may get the earned income credit. Again, even if you didn't make a whole lot of money, you should, you should file because you might get money back. Here's where they get to check, take advances, advantage of some tax, additional tax credits, some uh, uh, credit for fuel federal. Most people aren't going to take these advantage of these things. Most people are just going to have this little cell right here entered with the amount from their W-2. And because A. King put in more than he owes, he gets overpaid. Oops, that, that's not what I wanted to do. My apologies. He gets 
dollars $304, my apologies, overpaid. And this is tricky. They want you to then put it down again to get the refund. You know, they're, they're hoping you kind of don't do that. And then they'll what they'll do is they'll 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 assume you wanted to put it here in line 77 and that's roll it over to the next year. No, 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 no. Dame lo ahora mismo. Give it to me now. You know, that's why you have to write it twice. Uh, 304 is how much he was overpaid. He owed 1696. He paid in 2000 and so 304 is the amount that was overpaid. And they'll give it to me. Of course, if you owed more, then you'd have to do the other calculation. You'd have to subtract how much you owed for minus how much you brought in and put that number right here. And if you didn't pay enough, this is where the estimated tax penalty would show up. You see if TurboTax or one of the other tax preparation softwares uh, say you need to pay that, what you do is you zero it out and you send them the letter that I talked about. Are you with me? Does it make sense? Go over it again. Go over it again. Now, remember at the very beginning we said make sure you sign your return. Right. A. King signed his return. He dated it. And they want to know what your occupation is. Hmm. Well, of course, A. King back is a mattress tester. Not a bad job. And they want your phone number, but really they're never going to call you. Why do they want your occupation? Well, they have algorithms that they use to match you up against other mattress testers or barbers or teachers or doctors or whatever. And they kind of say, okay, you know, this makes sense. There's a little story. A student, a very colorful fellow, told me that he had spent eight months in one of the state correctional facilities because he had been growing marijuana in Northern California. And when he filed his taxes, did he lie about what he did? Did he claim every dollar he made? Yes. He ran it like a business, as a business. He, he took his expenses and his deductions. And then he put down cut flower grower. Did he lie? No, he didn't lie. That's what, that's what it is. <laughs> They're cut flowers. And so the state went after him, not the feds, because... When the feds go after the tax, uh, uh, I mean, they go after the uh, drug dealers, they go after them for taxes, for not paying their taxes. But this guy paid all his taxes. He he ran it like a business. He was a very interesting fellow. And uh, he, um, you know, he, 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 I assume, he, living here in San Diego, he wasn't growing marijuana. I don't know. But uh, how's that? That's a cute little story. So make sure you sign your return. Um, put your occupation down and uh, pop it in the mail or e-file it and your software program will show you how to do that. So, <sighs> yeah, I know, I know, it's, it's a slog. Slide 29. Uh-oh, oh man, oh, I put it in the mail, I, I e-filed it, what did I do wrong? If you find you have made a mistake, should you A, um, a, what should I do? Should I uh, leave the country? Uh, B, um, should I um, commit suicide? Uh, C, pretend it didn't happen. Well, this is what a lot of people do. And or side D, should I file form 1040X? Y yes, dear students, the correct answer is to file 1040X. Because they're, they're maybe not going to catch it. Maybe they will. But if you catch it before they catch it, It'll impress them, and it, it'll make your life, I think, a lot easier. And it might be in your favor. You know, it might not be necessarily in their favor. But what a lot of people do is see. They pretend it didn't happen, and then six months go by, and nine months go by, and a year goes by, and they think, okay, the IRS didn't catch it. And then 13 months go by. They get a friendly-looking letter, a friendly official-looking letter from the IRS saying, hey, you goofed. The IRS moves very slowly, but they do move. So... File 1040X. And lastly, don't forget the state of California. Right. Once the federal 1040 is finished, you get to tackle the state of California's form 
540. Cute, huh? Half. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, it's far less than half the work. Usually, there's just two forms. There's the 540 and then the 540 CA, which stands for California Adjustments. Huh? Well, United States government, the feds, tax your unemployment benefits. The state does not. The United States government, the feds, allow you to deduct your state income taxes. The state does not. So there are a few adjustments that have to be made. But it's really not that difficult. Once you, After you've done the 1040, it's actually pretty darn straightforward. Ugh. Yeah. And, of course, if you've done it electronically, they, they're going to say, oh, just pay us another $20 or $30 and we'll do the state for you. That they, that's how they upsell you. So, what are you going to do? You're going to go back over this again. And then again. Right? And then you know, three, four times is what most people, after they've done it three or four times, they really do have a pretty good idea of how the tax system works for a typical homeowner. But as we said, you may not be a typical homeowner. You might be just somebody who's just starting out, has just a you know, few thousand or maybe more, it doesn't matter, but you're single, you don't have any deductions. Then for you is 1040 EZ. And on the website, we have a sample 1040 EZ and a presentation about it. So you're going to want to take a look at that. And then the second tax uh, exercise is hint, 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 very similar to A. King's uh, tax return with a home and a uh, child tax credit. So you're going to want to do that. And the, the uh, data is there, but the answers are not. There's little stars for you to put things. And then the assignment is hint, hint. Yes, exactly. You're getting the idea. We want you to do this over and over and over again because once you've done it enough times, you will have it, dear students. I'm rooting for you, folks. I'm proud of you. Don't give up. Never give up. Do it once, twice, three times, four times, and then do it again once, twice, three times, four times, and you will be the envy of your friends and family because you'll actually understand how this crazy system works. We wish you the best of success. Do it again, folks.